I'm continuing my look back at the Kasparov Anand World Championship match from New York 1995. If you remember, the first eight games were drawn, and then Anand won the ninth, and then Kasparov hit back straight away in game 10 with a sensational victory. So, this is game 11, it's the halfway stage in the match, they're playing 20 games. Anand played his customary e4, and no huge surprises at the moment. Kasparov played his normal Sicilian defence, and Anand went for the open. And in all the games of the match up to this point, Kasparov had played his favourite Nidor variation. And they'd done battle with Bishop e2 and so on. But here Kasparov came up with a huge surprise. He played g6, the so-called dragon variation. Now, he'd never done this in a serious game in his life. So this was a massive shock for Anand. He couldn't have foreseen that Kasparov was going to do this. Now, I think this was a brilliant moment psychologically in the match for Kasparov to play this because Anand is feeling insecure after having lost this terrible game in game 10 which was a brilliant piece of home preparation for Kasparov. And suddenly he has to face this really sharp move where, again, it's all about preparation. If you've done your homework, you can simply win a game very easily when you play the dragon, and vice versa if you've prepared very well with white as well. So Anand psychologically was in a, in a terrible dilemma. I suspect that he wanted to play very safely today, maybe secure a slight advantage and try and work with that, but found himself facing a very, very sharp variation indeed. So after some thought, Anand played the main line, the so-called Yugoslav attack, and Kasparov playing his moves very quickly indeed. And here there's a big choice. You can castle queenside straight away, like so, which allows this very sharp pawn sacrifice that's currently a very popular variation actually for both sides. You can also play g4 which has come back into vogue. This was first played by Karpov actually in, in the late 70s. Or you can play the old main line, the bishop c4, and that's what Anand did in this game. So he castled and Knight e5, this is all absolutely standard, and now a very old move is to play Queen a5 and Rook across, Rook fc8. But Kasparov went with the more usual move, Rook c8. Now, people have tried to refute the dragon for decades and come very, very close indeed. There was, a, well, a famous game in the, the Karpov Korchnoi match from 1974, their candidates final match, where Karpov sprung an ex a, a fantastic novelty, well actually in, in this variation, and succeeded in beating Korchnoi. But the, the variation was rehabilitated after that, and here h5 was played by Kasparov. This is more reliable than the old move, knight c4, that Korchnoi played actually. And this is sort of the starting point of, of the dragon, um, the, the, the kind of main line. And here the most popular move is bishop g5, and probably the most dangerous move, actually. Anna knew this, of course, but he thought for some time and kind of <clears throat> declined to enter into that very theoretical variation. Complete his king to b1. Now this is a much safer move than that bishop g5. Kasparov continued with the standard plan of working down the c-file. But somehow, because white, well you could say wastes a tempo, it's not quite a wasted move, but it's certainly less sharp than playing on the king side, um, then black is able to develop his counterplay on the c-file much quicker. So it's a very safe move, but not the most aggressive. So knight e2 from Anand. The point of this is to protect the knights on c3. If you uh, play
play too quickly, then you know black can actually just sacrifice the exchange on c3 with excellent prospects, both positionally and well attacking prospects against the king. So this secures the knight on c3 and prepares to play bishop h6, exchanging off. That wouldn't be possible in the previous position. Uh, well, let me just show you why. <laughs> After bishop h6, it's possible to play rook takes d4. It's just a simple tactic, um, deflecting the queen. So knight d2, knight e2 prepares bishop h6 and protects the knight. And b5, well, black is developing his counterplay on the queen side very rapidly indeed. Actually, Anand has had exactly this, this position against Tivyakov, a great dragon specialist, a few years ago in Tilburg, 1992. And there, Anand had played, well, probably not a good move at all. This bishop d4, which allowed black to pursue his queenside ambitions very easily indeed. And in this position, black has a very simple idea. He's protected the d pawn and, and rook. He's ready to play bishop here, <clears throat> move the rook across, perhaps here, perhaps advance the a pawn. And already Tivyakov had a very promising position indeed. So on this day, Anand played in a more traditional way, exchanging off bishops on h6. But it's not really very dangerous for black. And Kasparov played what well, he said afterwards was a novelty. In fact, it had been played in a very old game. But the most popular move in that position, actually, before, was to play the pawn to b4. And that's also not a bad move. But queen a5 is very sensible indeed. Simple idea to play the rook across with pressure on c file and also bishop e6 is coming and then b4 and you can see that black's attack is developing <clears throat> very rapidly indeed. Excuse me one second while I have a quick slurp of tea. So Kasparov doing well at this point. Anand exchanged off. Oh, let me show you a little tactic, actually, because if you play the queen to a5 in this dragon, you always have to be wary of knight e5, which opens up this diagonal. But here, black can get away with it with tactics, as so often is the case. Now, white throws in this Zwischen Schach. King comes up. So it looks like white is a pawn up, but in fact knight e4 is a very nice response. And if the knight is taken, then the rook forks both knights. So in that way, this knight e5 move isn't working. Well, Anand played it safe. He exchanged off and maneuvered the knight round to f4 just in time. If the rook had been here, then that would be impossible because of b4 or sacrifice. You know, it'd be terrible. But he gets there just in time. Now he can play knight d5. And this is just simplifying the position. Kasparov exchanged on d2 and at this moment offered Anand a draw. Now this is only after 19 moves. Anand thought for four minutes and played a move, declined the draw. Now why did he do this? Well, I think psychologically it would have been very difficult to accept the draw because that would just be showing Kasparov that his opening ploy with the dragon had been a complete psychological success. Also, the players were under some pressure from the crowd, actually, in this event for finishing games too quickly because they'd had this series of eight draws. So I think that might have played a part, actually. But also, I think Anand believed that in this endgame, he had absolutely nothing to fear. So why not play on? I mean, I would personally favour white a little bit here. I think the knight is a slightly better piece than the bishop. It's about the same. But it is basically equal. White has slightly better central control, but there's nothing really going on. I don't understand why Kasparov played rook b8 here. I think he could have just played bishop e6 straight away. But anyway, black risks absolutely nothing in this position. As, as does white. So 
just improving the position a little bit from White's viewpoint, but nothing really very serious going on here. And the knight comes back. I mean, nothing much has changed in the position. And here, we were all anticipating that Anand would simplify the position by taking here. And, well, it's again one of these instances where White can take on e7 in the dragon, but actually it leads to simplification. Looks, it looks as though, through this pin, that black is winning a piece. He isn't, because after this move, in fact, they simplify into a drawn rook and pawn endgame. So you can see pawns are equal, and now black will just chop off more pawns here, and it's going to be a draw. So that would have been a kind of very logical conclusion to the game, you could say. But instead, Anand had a brainstorm. He played this pawn move here. This was a complete miscalculation. In this position, he can still play on with this move. Um, and probably he should draw this position. He's, he's a bit worse. Um, the rook comes around and starts attacking here. It's a little bit unpleasant for white, but should still be drawn. Instead, Anand played the knight here. Well, it doesn't look bad, forking the rooks. Now, perhaps he'd anticipated in this position, he thought black should simply, would simply have to play the rook back. And here, this should also be a draw, actually. Black has a bishop and pawn against a rook, but a completely sound pawn structure, a very safe king, should be a draw. Maybe that's what he thought would happen. But in this position... Kasparov smacked out this move on the board. He cracked it out. And Anand resigned the game. Let's have a look. Well, first of all, if king takes rook, then rook takes. Black is two pawns up here with a completely winning position. So what about rook takes rook? Well, this is the point. Anand had forgotten that there was this discovered check and black picks up the rook and again is two pawns up and that is an utterly hopeless ending. So this was a tragic blow for Anand. After game nine he was one game up and after game 11 he was one down. He'd lost two in a row. Something happened <laughs> similar in um, his match against Carlsen and it takes a lot to come back from that. Thanks for watching.